Okay, well, um, we're a little bit uh, after 10 o'clock, so maybe I should gavel us to order here. And we have a nice little crowd, very nice. I appreciate that, especially for people coming during the holidays. Uh, so uh, welcome uh, everyone to uh, the Science, Science Circle's uh, continuing program of panel discussions. Um, and we're doing a little bit of a different format uh, today, uh, rather than uh, sort of um, having a topic uh, with a panel of uh, experts to discuss the topic. Um, I've assembled uh, some of our uh, favorite Science Circle panelists. And um, what we want to do uh, this time is just uh, take end of the year questions from our uh, studio audience and um, and use those as a uh, uh, as a trigger for hopefully some uh, fun uh, discussion and maybe we can even answer some questions. Um, uh, so I hope uh, some of you have maybe come prepared with a question to ask, or maybe as the discussion goes on, you'll think of a question to ask. So I guess maybe the best way to do this is to uh, simply type your question into the nearby chat and I will uh, exercise my executive authority to select questions. Um, and of course, if any of the panelists, uh, if any of the questions, uh, you know, uh, if any of the panelists wanna answer a particular question that, uh, that I didn't select or something, uh, feel free to chime. What is the meaning of life? 42. <laughs> you know, I do think, uh, you know, the, the meaning of life question is a little bit interesting because I think one of the uh, objections that um, people of faith have is that science doesn't provide any meaning to life and that uh, and that the spirituality does provide meaning. Um, and uh, so I think uh, people who are uh, who do not have faith, um, uh, you know, have to find a different way to find meaning, to find the meaning of life. All right. Uh, looks like uh, we have a question from uh, Cass, Star Cass, um, about the sun. She says, the sun's corona heats up to 6 million degrees centigrade. There is no definitive explanation why it is getting so hot there. Uh, is there any progress in understanding um, the, the, uh, the, sun, the, the heat of the sun's corona? I, well, I, I guess I'll field that one. Um, <clears throat> happy holidays, everyone. Uh, I, I've, I've always loved panel discussions, and uh, as I've mentioned to some, um, panel discussions can benefit from more discussion, specifically uh, audience participation, and today audience participation is required. As to Cass's qu uh, question, I don't remember the name of the latest solar mission. There was a, a recent solar mission where they're um, trying to understand better the magnetic field in the above the sun's corona. Um, <clears throat> the uh, reason for having such a hot corona, one th uh, thing to keep in mind is that it, even though the gas is very hot, millions of degrees, it's extremely low density, uh, just a tiny fraction of the, of the density in the, of, of the sun's photosphere. Um, <clears throat> what seems to be happening is that there are mag strong magnetic fields. The, the envelope of the sun is uh, is convective means that there's that's like a pot of boiling water this the parker solar probe I, it might be that one but i think there's a slightly more recent one but because it's like a pot of boiling water and it's uh, filled with ionized hydrogen basically a lot of charged particles um boiling and boiling and, and uh moving up and down they uh they, there's a magnetic field that threads these um charged particles 
and the magnetic field lines are constantly twisted and uh, it will even break and they have to reconnect because you can't have a disconnected field line. And that's, that's called magnetic reconnection, which releases a lot of energy into this solar mass ejections, for example, solar flares. Um, this kind of energy will heat the corona. Um, I, I don't think that that necessarily explains entirely what causes the high, high temperatures in the corona. But this new miss mission has apparently found that the magnetic field is even more energetic above the photosphere. And that may uh, explain the, uh, the high temperatures. Um, I seem to have heard recently uh, there's some new data that suggests that the uh, magnetic fields uh, that are sort of uh, uh, binding this energy in the corona actually uh, sort of is emitted from the surface, uh, the magnetic field, in a kind of a, a twisting braid um, that the, the the magnetic fields kind of corkscrew um, away from the uh, uh, from the corona. Um, and this this uh, apparently this sort of dynamic nature of these magnetic fields is um, was a little bit of a surprise. Yes, that's that's right. The magnetic fields they thread uh, probably quite deeply into the sun, and as the sun rotates, of course, it's going to it's going to twist the magnetic field. And there are other other energetic phenomena occurring because of the convection in the solar envelope. Above the solar core, the core is radiated, but the envelope is is, is convective. So that would I might add by I might add by general education is uh, as you may know, temperature is a measure of how energetic particles are. So you can have very rarefied <laughs> particles, like in the upper atmosphere and stuff. It would be high temperature; they're bouncing around a lot. There's a lot of energy there, and you can have then very dense. Obviously, as you get to the sun itself and you get deeper, it's very dense. So temperature there means a lot because you've got a lot of particles very close to each other. Whereas in the corona or in the upper atmosphere, um, the particles are fairly rarefied. You can see through it. <laughs> uh, so temperature there may not mean when you say six million degrees it wouldn't be the same i mean it's six million degrees because they're bouncing around a lot but it's not the same as saying 10 a million degrees in the center of the sun or ten thousand at the surface yes that's right i mean if you have such low densities you have basically low pressure despite the extremely high temperature but the, you have the energy from the from the uh from the convection in the solar envelope we'll get, get into the uh, uh, get into the into the corona and as uh as Matthew has pointed out, this, these new data have suggested the ener energy from that magnetic field was even higher than previously thought. Uh, okay, that's fantastic. Um, if you don't mind, let me move along to our next question so we can get in as many questions as possible. Um, Steven Zutify asks, what is the latest news and prospects for propulsion systems in the next 50 years? Um, he says, I thought I heard about a near light speed system that may be possible. What uh, energy and technology uh, would that take to work? So uh, this is kind of a speculative question, maybe an opportunity to kind of speculate about what sorts of new technologies can we look forward to maybe in the next, uh, in the near term. Well, I'm going to jump in with a quick thought. Um, if we're going at light speed, then there will be uh, or near light speed, then there will be a lot of particles in space that will be hitting the front of the spacecraft. So heat shielding um, and uh, just making sure that the um, spacecraft is not abraded away by uh, hitting small uh, particles. That's going to be an important uh, thing for us to develop. Well, that's the advantage of the space warp. <laughs> We need a warp drive that warps space around the ship so that we don't encounter any particles. We sort of travel through space in a protective envelope. <laughs> yeah, that was in one of the Arthur C. Clarke stories. Um, uh, it's not a new idea. That basically, they have a, a, a large, um, thick bow of ice. And as you travel through the interstellar medium, it'll slowly eat away at that ice from the uh, high energy collisions with the uh, ice bow. And it'll slowly eat away over time. And then what you have to do is you have to replenish it, put an, another uh, layer of uh, ice on it. 
Uh, that's featured in uh, Alistair Reynolds' stories uh, more recently, too. One oh. of the more interesting things I've heard of as far as propulsion, it wouldn't be for human vehicles, but um, the, the little <laughs> a myriad of uh, very light vehicles that we could send to Alpha Centauri, in other words, laser um, reflects on them and they accelerate up to a quarter of the speed of light and so we could actually get a uh, vehicle with a small camera or sensors to Alpha Centauri within about 25 years. I think that's a pretty amazing um, thing. It's, uh, we, we couldn't get there ourselves, but we could get uh, these tiny little uh, feather light vehicles to the next star. I think that's pretty amazing. So that's yeah, sort of that's cool. cool. Yeah, that's uh, that uh, sounds a little bit like a solar sail, but enhanced by uh, by human laser energy. Would you need to um, direct the laser from outer space so you don't have to, you know, you don't have to shoot it through the Earth's atmosphere? Would it be something maybe done from the space station or something like that? Yeah, the idea, I think, is to have a whole bunch of tiny, um, these would be tiny uh, spheres that are only a few centimeters in size, and they would be, uh, the lasers would shoot shoot them uh, into interstellar space um, towards whatever target you're, you're aiming for. You're not pointed Earth, yes. Oh, that's great. That's pretty cool. Well, I don't think we quite answered Stephen's questions. Uh, I, I do yeah. recall... I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll full disclosure here, I am actually checking the web, which is, I suppose, kind of cheating a bit, but um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I do. Oh, I do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I, I do recall recently hearing about something called electrothermal, electrothermal type of drive, which is basically you have a superheated pl a plasma and you fire it through a, 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 some nozzle to... Uh, generate thrust and I think this is also for airplanes as, uh, but it could be used for rockets um, and I think I, I, I did hear something about that so what kind of time frame would be look would be, be would we be looking at uh, uh, to implement this kind of technology is this uh, is 50 years a reasonable time frame or is that would it be you know is that something that's right around the corner or more distant in the future the problem with diff uh, predicting the future is that uh, things are ever accelerating. So it, it could happen in the next, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, maybe, it could, maybe it would be longer than that. But, I mean, things are constantly accelerating. So it's, it's difficult to predict. Well, now that we have a space force, maybe that will accelerate things. Wink, <laughs> wink. Speaking of accelerating, uh, I found it kind of interesting that the – I'm trying to remember the names of the <laughs> – whether it's the Voyager probes or the Pioneers. Eh, yeah, Voyager and Pioneers. The Voyager probes, even though they were launched long after the Pioneer probes, is that they actually left the solar system before because the earlier probes didn't have the uh, acceleration or technology at the time. So we could easily, say, launch something out into space and something decades later might uh, surpass it because of enhanced technology. Yeah, they pass beyond the sun's influence. There's a, a boundary layer between the sun's influence and where the solar wind meets the interstellar medium, and the, the both Voyager spacecraft um, uh, cross that, that boundary. Yeah, I saw some interesting uh, news recently about the Voyager craft that apparently there the boundary crossings were different. Um, uh, I, I think the early one had kind of a a dirty boundary crossing that seemed to take longer, um, whereas the more recent uh, Voyager craft, when it left, seemed to have a cleaner, uh, cleaner break from the solar system into deep space. Um, am I, am I on the right track with that? Yes, you are. Uh, one, one, we're moving through the uh, interstellar medium. The sun is moving through the interstellar medium, and there's a, a boundary. Uh, around the sun, which is not spherical, it's, it's pulled out into a teardrop shape as we move through the uh, interstellar medium. And so, uh, one Voyager spacecraft passed through, um, I think, what you, you'd call the front, and one passed through the side. Oh, I see. Fascinating. Um, 
the 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 dynamics of that have got to be interesting because the um, you know the sun is twirling around the center of the of the Milky Way at almost nine hundred thousand kilometers per hour um, and is sort of dragging the solar system along with it um, and it uh, that creates some uh, very interesting um, just mechanical dynamics. Yeah, well, I don't know if you call it dragging it along. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the, there is no, there's nothing, uh, there's no kind of drag in space. And this is, you know, something about flat earthers. The flat earthers say that, oh, you know, we're moving at these incredible speeds through this universe and we don't feel it. Well, you wouldn't feel it. I mean, there's, there's, when there's, when there's motion through space, there's, there's not, no, no drag force to give you the feeling of motion and any accelerations are extremely tiny. So you're not going to be doing this when it's motionless. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That's a really good point. Um, let's see. It looks like we have another audience question. Um, uh, again, Stephen asks, uh, mentioning Space Force reminds me that this idea preceded Trump's fascination with it. It really seems a reasonable way uh, to create a focused chain of command for dealing with space-based weaponry and information and information systems. What are your thoughts in that? Um, I just, I guess I'll just editorially uh, mention that um, uh, I can see Stephen's point with respect to a, a chain of command with respect to um, uh, uh, orbital weaponry, but I am a little bit concerned because we do have a space treaty that is supposed to you know, outlaw the weaponization of space. And I'm a little bit confused about um, sort of uh, how the legality of, uh, in terms of international treaties about what exactly the Space Force is going to be doing. So I just want to throw that thought in all. And do uh, any of the panelists have any uh, thoughts about that? I don't have any specific thoughts on the Space Force or, 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 or the military, uh, I mean, if we want to understand the legality of that, it's a lawyer up here somewhere. Um, help us with that. Um, well, I've looked into it a little bit myself, but this uh, the Outer Space Treaty is a little bit vague uh, about um, uh, what um, uh, what what is allowed. And I have to admit, I haven't brushed up on it lately. But um, if you read up about the uh, the Outer Space Treaty. It's not really that helpful, and I suspect that um, the Space Force, the creation of Space Force is in some sense sort of exploiting the ambiguity or the vagueness of the treaties, um, which does not, doesn't seem like a really good thing. I think, I personally think maybe a better way to have gone about doing this would have been in fact to convene an international um, uh, body to in fact, maybe write a new outer space treaty that would sort of clarify these issues before we in fact created the space force. Well, thanks. That's, that's a good point. And, and it's usual that the science is leading and, and, and the, the law is, is lagging. Um, no, no, no intended criticism there, but that's, that's the way things are going. Well, I do have a general thing to say that um, Carl Sagan brought up in his book, the pale blue dot, uh, uh, weapons that could be used against the earth which are extremely frightening is that we all talked about using um technology rocket technology to divert asteroids from hitting the earth well they can be used in the other sense where someone who has that technology can direct the asteroids towards earth and aim the asteroids towards your enemies and that would create an incredible level of destruction you choose the asteroid of just the right size and you destroy the country that you want to destroy it would have effects around the world but if you can just destroy, you know, a few cities, major cities in a, in a certain country, you can destroy your enemy. This is particularly frightening. Wow, that is intense. I have to say, it reminds me a little bit of that scene in Dr. Strangelove where, in the war room, where the, the president goes, you know, uh, or I think it's Dr. Strangelove actually who says, you know, uh, you know, why did you create a doomsday bomb or doomsday machine and not tell anyone? The whole point of a doomsday machine is to tell people. So, you know, so it deters people, you know, deters, uh, it's a deterrent. Yeah, well, uh, of course, knowing, uh, about this, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, you you do need some kind of deterrent. I mean, there's legality there too. What what do you do with someone has a technology to shift around asteroids? Um, you have to have the proper uh, legality, and you have to have a way of, of enforcing those laws. Yeah. So that yeah, that that's a very interesting topic. Um, and uh, frightening. Yeah, and frightening. Uh, let me move along with some other questions here. We have a couple of good ones. Uh, um, uh, one, I think Vic was asking, uh, what is what might be the role of AI in uh, space? No, no, I was just uh, repeating one of the questions that were earlier that was missed. Oh, thank you. Okay, yeah, I see. Actually, it was uh, Neuro uh, Wander who uh, who asked that. So, uh, any thoughts about AI? And I think what. I think uh, are we thinking about sort of a like uh, an AI like the the Starship Enterprise computer, or are we also thinking about you know robots that maybe autonomous robots? I'll jump in. Um, I think that we have to make a distinction between um, systems that are primarily just tools and don't have consciousness or motives of their own versus um, more elaborate technologies that are actually going to uh, be uh, self-aware. Uh, the self-aware um, creatures, because um, they're created creatures, um, would be excellent explorers and uh, excellent partners if uh, they're treated well. And oh, now I see my conversation going towards uh, Terminator. Um, now, basically, um, our we talking about uh, developing uh, partners in scientific exploration or um, simply just tools? And I've seen uh, discussions on uh, both sides of uh, this sort of divide. I mean, one advantage of an autonomous AI is that it could respond in real time. A, a problem with tools that we send into space that have to be controlled from space, you know, is you have to send commands to them hours in advance. So then you don't get the data back hours um and so this i think this uh really limits what we can do with um with earth controlled robots in space so i think the the ability to have autonomous uh ex exploration unit um you know would be more n nimble and would be able to respond to their environment and right absolutely um but you also have to think about uh, what their needs are. Hopefully, they will be interested in doing their jobs, um, and you know, are not just kind of holding data hostage uh, for, um, you know, the next episode of uh, the Star Wars movies uh, that uh, come down because they like the Star Wars too. Um, okay, since we talked about the Space Force and about AI, I'm gonna. Uh, combine these. <laughs> is this, anyone remember the science fiction? It's a great science fiction from about the 1950s, where essentially there were two, let's say, countries that were fighting each other, and they were shooting missiles at each other, and each of the AI systems would be able to avoid the missiles, and they'd been doing it for hundreds of years, so they decided to put humans in the nose cones of the rockets because uh, they were unpredictable, and then so one nation was able to win the war that way. I'm just combining. Well, that's a big yikes. Um, but unfortunately, we've done uh, such things before. Um, you know, the kamikaze pilots in um, World War II, uh, and actually there were um, um, torpedo submarine uh, versions of the same thing with uh, human-derived guidance systems. So um, uh, while that's a very uh, scary thought, it actually has precedent. Holy moly. Well, um, all right, I still want to get a few more questions in. So, and I, uh, Chantal has a kind of interesting question that I'm also curious about, which is what do we think about uh, Elon Musk's uh, internet satellites, that he's putting up thousands of little satellites in low Earth orbit to improve internet, and I think also GPS. Um, and this is already creating problems with Earth-based astronomy. And it just, I, I am personally really nervous about having all of this clutter uh, in low Earth orbit. I mean, at some point, it seems to me it's going to be difficult for us to launch rockets 
beyond low Earth orbit because we're going to be, you know, we'll have to, it'll be hard to get through all this junk. So I'd be very interested in your all's take about it. Yeah, I was going to say basically the two things that you said. One is that there's going to be a lot more uh, debris up there. Uh, but th this will be in, in, in well-defined orbits, so you can avoid them by, by knowing the, the schedules. The problem I have is that it's, uh, as mentioned before, observational astronomy, which I mentioned, that they're going to be a little bit too bright. So you have to schedule your observations. You have to you have to basically cut out. If you're doing long integrations over the night, you're going to have to cut out those times when the satellite is, is too near your field of view. So... Uh, I'm a little bit wary of this. I mean, apparently Elon Musk has said something about this, that he's going to try to make the satellites dim, but I wonder how that's going to work. Uh, this seems like um, an area that uh, could you really take advantage of materials science. Uh, I'm wondering if there's a way they can uh, create these uh, little satellites from, I don't know, transparent materials or like you say, dim materials, non-reflective materials, I don't know, but um, I think it could really uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, take advantage of uh, advances in material science. Right, well, pigments and dyes are a active field of uh, research. There's um, always the search for the new blackest dye or new pinkest dye. I suppose if uh, the, um, satellites were uh, small enough so that they could uh, radiate heat out. Having a totally black exterior uh, would, um, you know, the only problem would for observational astronomy at that point would be them eclipsing objects of uh, interest if they didn't reflect any light. Um, I do want to make a point. Um, socially, there have been some countries like Russia and China and uh, Iran who have been experimenting with disconnecting from the global internet uh, and having a global internet that people could not disconnect from would uh, make it much more difficult to control the flow of information. Um, I heard a news report that Russia is looking at that too and it's isolating yes. its internet. Yes, that was on PBS. Yeah, making, making things black is also going to cause other problems. Is that you you absorb too much sunlight, the satellites overheat, so you have to have some way of, of reflecting away the light. Hmm. They might have to have some kind of coolant system, which would make them more complicated. Yeah, I guess if they are absorbing visible light and re-radiating in the infrared, then infrareds. Um, observations just get messed up too. Um, so uh, it's a bit of a no win there. Um, so let's kind of uh, delve into this internet issue a little bit. How how are countries able to uh, cut their internet off from the global internet? Um, uh, is this just a matter of um, creating, uh, do they have to create sort of their own internal wiring or um, or, uh, or, or or radio feeds or something um, in terms of the connectivity? Um, is it just a matter of, of um, banning Google uh, from their web browsers or something? Uh, do you all know anything about sort of how that's actually achieved? Well, let me take this one since I headed the Computer Information Cybersecurity program at our university is um, essentially there's way more inter there's way more networks than just the internet in fact most uh, there's the internet is simply kind of the one that's public that uh, people can get to uh, so in other words most a lot of corporations things like that, government agencies and stuff uh, military all have their own private uh, networks that are just not connected and uh, you're right with the IP addresses. It's, it's, um, there are agencies that control what blocks of IP addresses you have and stuff. And the easiest way to do it is, is that we're all connected through basically internet service providers and as far as the public internet goes. But as far as anything else, somebody else, anyone who has a can uh, secure a block of IP addresses uh, and then have their own routers and 
uh, servers and switches and stuff can create their own network. Uh, all you have to do is have enough money and um, be able to keep it uh, secure. Um, so it, it, the other thing is that, that in countries, it happens all the time. So for example, all you have to do is um, control the, uh, the routers. I mean, the internet is simply a network of routers. Uh, so if you can control them and the companies that can control them, then you can control the um, uh, network. Um, that That's the simplest explanation. It's ha it ha happens all the times in countries that want to control the information. Are the, it seems to me that this um, has great risk for social unrest because, um, you know, I would imagine that Iranians and Russians and uh, uh, countries that have already had access to the internet and then find their access shut off. I mean, they're going to be cut off from a lot of global popular culture. I mean, they maybe what if they they won't know what uh, you know they won't know what cutie pie is doing on YouTube or <laughs> what the latest memes are or I don't know what. Um, and uh, I would imagine that you know this is going to you know. Once you've had a taste of that and it gets taken away, that it just seems like that is politically quite risky. Um, you know, I, I contrast this with, say, North Korea. The North Koreans have never had at any access to that, so they don't really know what they're missing. But in, in the, you know, in some of the uh, more developed countries, I guess, it seems to me that, uh, um, you know, even if you can technically uh, isolate your own Internet, um, you're just asking for trouble in the long run. Well, uh, that, that's a very good thing. Let me just throw in one more thing. And then, um, is that in the Jurassic Park movies, uh, there's the thing about life will find a way. <laughs> so, and that's essentially what happens in these cases is people always find some way around this to get uh, information uh, to each other. It's almost impossible to block all conversation uh, because there because there's so many different types of technologies and sizes of networks with the internet you're just talking about one large network but if you use uh, technologies that only go a certain distance and basically uh, just connect uh, people to people rather than uh, to routers and such you can bypass a lot of this stuff it happened during the Arab Spring it happened during I mean there's people are very resourceful as, as Chantel uh, mentioned. So uh, once you let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, um, <laughs> it's impossible to keep uh, people from uh, communicating. Well, it was sort of an opposite example that some people have been mentioning where um, China, uh, where it would be actually risky to let them see certain things because, for example, the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989, most Ch young Chinese know nothing about that because they can't access that information outside of China and the Chinese government doesn't want them to know. Huh. Hmm. Um, somebody even mentioned carrier pigeons <laughs> and you're a wonder. <laughs> you can always go analog if you can't go, uh, if you can't go digital. Um, but that is a little, uh, but, uh, you know, but China probably is an interesting case study because they actually have pretty, been able to pretty effectively isolate their population. Although you can sign into Alibaba from the West uh, and shop on Alibaba. Completely detached. Smoke signals. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, just to kind of, uh, at the risk of turning this into kind of a bull session, this idea that people are resourceful and will find a way. Um, I'm also, it kind of makes me think that uh, I know there's um, in American politics, there's uh, in, on the progressive politics, there's a lot of interest in um, really uh, um, weakening the power of billionaires and plutocrats and uh, the ultra, the ultra wealthy, the the point zero one percent of the world, um, try to really diminish their influence in politics, and I, I sort of think that like life, 
I think power and money finds a way. I just don't, I kind of feel like power and money will, will not let itself be shut out of politics, no matter how much democracy might demand it. Um, I, so I'm a little bit skeptical of this kind of impulse. Um, my personal view is that, you know, a more practical approach is to, is to bend that power and that money to your will. <laughs> um, and uh, but I don't know. That's just my idea. But I'm I just uh, like shutting off countries from the internet. I think it's uh, also going to be difficult to shut, uh, you know, power and money out of politics. In so. line with what you're saying, I mean, you're basically quite right. I mean, we have a way of um, uniting the population against power, but at the same time, the power can fight back very effectively. And one very good example of that is the climate crisis why we're still many people debating about whether right. climate change is actually occurring. Well, the reason they do is because there's so much money, there are literally trillions of dollars in the hands of big oil, and they're fighting back, and they have very subtle and clever ways of fighting back. The subtle and clever ways are uh, really fascinating. Um, the um, psychology of how people can get manipulated um, on, through social media is uh, just fascinating. Um, you know, very uh, small groups of uh, people who happen to be well-funded can um, get messages amplified uh, through technology, a theme that we've been uh, talking about um, a little bit. And uh, this this ends up being um, a problem that we are only just beginning to scratch the surface of. It's going to be pretty much, um, you know, a um, um, an arms race, perhaps, uh, tit for tat, for uh, stopping certain behaviors and then circumventing them. What do you guys think? Yeah, that's correct. I, there's, um, let's see, I heard this on Quirks and Quarks, as a matter of fact. There are there are groups, or at least one group that I know of. Um, which group it was, but the point is they were uh, studying the effects of misinformation. Can you harden people to misinformation so that they pick out misinformation better? And the truth is you can. You give them certain um, surveys or questionnaires and ask them to figure out which things are true and which things are false, and over time they get better. They can tell which things are true and which are false, and that's, that's something that the population needs to um, uh, learn more about. Uh, that's uh, uh, quite interesting, and it reminds me of a kind of a humorous situation that's occurring in Canada. Uh, Canada issued a PSA um, to educate uh, its population about the emergence of deep fakes, in deep fake videos, and uh, the PSA in, to illustrate this uh, uses a little tiny virtual hippopotamus that uh, sort of wanders around in your house and causes trouble, kind of like a little gremlin. And um, but the PSA backfired because people thought that there really were little virtual hippos like that was a real thing. And so uh, instead of instead of educating people about deep fakes, it just illustrated how easy it is for people to fall for deep. Fakes. And the, the, what's weird is that the CGI little hippo is not even the CGI isn't even that good. So I'm just giving some um, uh, dirty looks at my cats who do wander around like little hippos getting into the way. You, you <laughs> think they would be uh, graceful, but they're kind of clumsy. I'll try to find a uh, I'll find a link to the PSA video uh, uh, and, and post that before we're finished here. Now we're in the pocket of big hippo. Uh, okay, so we have a new question uh, from uh, NeuroWander. How can knowledge gained through space exploration help us survive on our own planet with climate change? Well, yeah, that's an excellent question. There are probably a number of answers to that. One I can think of uh, off the top of my head is with space exploration, we understand much better what the surface of Venus is like. Venus is not that far, um, it's not that 
much further, uh, much not much closer to the sun than the Earth is, but yet it's a it's a living hell. It's almost like uh, the Earth is going to become a Venus in the future, um, or and or Venus Earth in the future will become a current what Venus is currently, um, and that's of course very frightening. And if we can understand what's happening on Venus, we might understand a little bit better what's happening on the Earth. The advantage to studying other planets in general is if you can understand what's happening with their atmospheres, for example, Jupiter, you can understand what's happening with our atmosphere. Um, you know, it strikes me one of the things, I mean, you know, uh, you know, Venus sort of uh, got into a feedback loop where it just kept getting hotter and hotter. And of course, those processes also occurred on Earth. But, you know, but Earth has life. And, you know, life kind of acts as kind of a, a homeostasis uh, agent that can help moderate uh, the Earth from slipping into um, uh, these feedback loops. Um, uh, and also the Earth has volcanism um, and plate tectonics, which can also sort of help moderate uh, 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 perpetual feedback loops. Um, but, you know, uh, nevertheless, it is not comforting because, you know, certainly uh, the Earth has experienced, you know, really close calls where life was almost wiped out. And um, so I don't think we can ever be cavalier about the risks that that could happen. You're talking about the Gaia hypothesis where a life will change the environment in which it lives. And, and there may be some truth to that. But as you said, there have been close calls, and I don't know when this happened exactly. Um, uh, Chantel prefers it if we answer without the internet, but I, I, I will still use it now and then. Sorry, Chantel. Um, in the past, like I was like two billion years ago, three billion years ago, there there was a, an ice ball Earth. Um, the Earth had become completely covered in snow and ice, and uh, you think that it's a feedback loop. What happens is the uh, uh, snow and ice reflect away the sunlight, and um, it doesn't stay uh, trapped in the atmosphere, so the Earth cools, and that just causes more snow to fall and more more ice to form, and you end up with a tremendous global cool cooling. So the uh, the Earth should never have warmed up again, but we were saved by volcanoes. Volcanoes produced a lot of ash on the surface, which allowed the sunlight to be absorbed, and that helped to break out of that uh, snowball earth. And it's important to keep uh, perspective about those events uh, because there were cycles of snowball earth and so forth stayed by volcanism. But those processes occurred over geological time periods uh, over millions of years. Um, and what we're confronting with climate change um, is not happening over geological time periods. It's happening within human lifespan. And this this is introducing kind of it seems to me a kind of a novel, uh, sort of a novel event on Earth, um, and you know maybe something akin to the extinction of the dinosaurs, sort of a cataclysmic event that happens very quickly, um, and uh, you know it and it took it took life a long time to recover from the extinction of the the you know from various extinction events, um, and really reshapes the biosphere of the Earth and so forth. So, um, uh, so I don't you know I think. Um, Perhaps some people who think that global warming won't be that bad sort of um, are not considering the um, – uh, if, you, if you're citing the history of the Earth as evidence that global warming won't be that bad or that we can recover from it, I'm not sure they're really fully keeping uh, um, the context of the, of, of the history of the Earth in mind. Well, the good news is the Earth will still be here and all that, but – uh, the animals that we know and perhaps us won't. Maybe that's better for the Earth, but it's not so good for us. Mm. Yep, maybe it wouldn't be so bad if the Earth purged itself of humans. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very good point that uh, these events occurred over long time scales. So uh, Vic provided the, the I, I didn't know exactly when the snowball Earth occurred. Apparently it happened more than once, 750. That's, it lasted a long time didn't clear up overnight. So these things happen on very long time scales, but global warming or climate change humans is happening over a period of just uh, a couple hundred years and 
that's again i like the word frightening because it's it's frightening the good news about i always like to you know throw in some good news <laughs> the good news about the uh, snowball earth and about mass extinctions which of course we've had many of them is that they tend to i'm trying to think of the word but they basically tend to begat a proliferation of new species in life uh, to take up the, ni the niches in the ecology. So uh, some of our worst ones have um, uh, brought about, about um, fantastic uh, new creatures and such. And that's, of course, why we're here. Once, a, once everything over five kilograms uh, died in the um, uh, 70 million years ago, um, it begat all of what is today. So that's, that's the good news. Well, all right. Thank you for that that nugget for that read of hope. <laughs> yeah, and of course, one one of the disasters uh, led to us. I mean, mammals weren't particularly dominant creatures in the uh, in the uh, Cretaceous period, thanks to the uh, I suppose it was an asteroid that collided with the Earth, and it, it may also have been volcanoes that um, went off about the same time too. Um, the dinosaurs were no longer dominant after that. Mammals could become dominant. You know, I'm a little bit uh, confused about the nature of the dinosaur extinction event uh, because, especially I think just in this last year or so, like new data seems to, uh, you know, new fossil discoveries seems to suggest that uh, that the die-off was very quick, that the, the, uh, the, uh, the asteroid that hit the Earth um, you know, sort of the way the theory goes is that it sent, you know, the ejecta from the explosion uh, sent shards into outer space, um, uh, which became glass-like uh, when they went into outer space. Um, you know, the silica and so forth uh, just crystallized into glass, and then all this glass rained back down on the Earth. And this all happened within a matter of hours or days or something like that. And that the as the as the ejecta fell back down on the earth, it ignited in the atmosphere, burning the atmosphere. I mean, there's a whole scenario that's been worked out from this new data. And it sounds absolutely apocalyptic that it just would have destroyed all life on Earth. I'm not really I'm a little bit confused about how anything survived that. So this whole new um uh, sort of model for the dinosaur extinction is absolutely horrifying to me and also confusing. Well, well my understanding. Go ahead. Life, but, yeah, thanks. Uh, it didn't destroy all life. It's something like seventy percent of of life, which is you know pretty major. Uh, the Great Permian extinction, like at two hundred fifty million years, that was like ninety percent of life. And, and then yeah, just, and it only destroyed, destroyed everything that's above about five kilograms. In other words, uh, mammals at the time were very small. Birds are still around, they're dinosaurs. So anything that uh, basically um, was smaller than that was able to eat what was left, uh, go underground, uh, eat seeds, uh, that sort of thing, scavenge. Uh, but that was my understanding is, um, and okay. then of course there's uh, critters in the seas that are still around. Uh, crocodiles are still around. I mean, it didn't destroy everything. Uh, like what Syzygy is saying, that there were mass extinctions that destroyed far more. In fact, even the Snowball Earth one destroyed uh, yes, that's true. Uh, yeah, far the, more yeah. percentage. Um, uh, you know, in, in view of, of that um, history, it is wild to me that, that the genetic code, the life's genetic code, just maintained a, th maintained a through line through all of that. You know, it's not like... Um, DNA was um, like recreated over and over again. You know, there was sort of a single origin of life moment, and then that, and the sent sort of with bacteria and so forth, and that genetic code has maintained a through line through all of those extinction events. Um, so that, you know, we can find, you know, we can um, uh, think there are rare instances where we're able to extract. You know, DNA from fossils and so forth, I think, something like that. You know, it is still just like our DNA now. And um, uh, so this, it, that just blows my mind, actually, that, uh, that this, this, this continuity of life um, has been able to maintain a through line.
Yeah, it is amazing. I think the, the, the real expert here will be, uh, I think Steven, Steven uh, Zutfly is more of an expert on this than we are. I don't know if life just formed uh, in, just in one place on the Earth. It, it might have happened in a number of places on the Earth where the conditions were right for it. Well, yeah. I think the most, uh, the, you know, the most Darwinian approach would be to say that if there were multiple origins of life, then um, the um, systems that develop that reproduce the best have taken over and uh, dominated. So certainly our uh, DNA um, that, you know, we share um, our DNA with almost with, with just about every other living thing on uh, the planet that came from the most successful um, uh, group of organisms. Um, well, that, yes, and that's actually that's a really good point. Um, uh, so thanks for uh, sort of uh, uh, jogging me about that. And, you know, sort of evidence of that are the, uh, you know, the deep sea thermal vent creatures that metabolize sulfur. I mean, in some ways that might be like a different model uh, or an example of a different, uh, a more primitive origin of life. So it is possible that there were, maybe there were competing uh, uh, ways for life to metabolize, and uh, we're simply the uh, the uh, the ancestors of the of, uh, of one successful model. Well, it is amazing what life will do to um, find energy sources, to find food sources. I I saw a article about a year ago, I think it was, maybe it was two years ago, um, where um, um, some uh, bacteria had been. Um, bred, not engineered, but essentially um, bred over, it was only three generations, I think, and they were able to use silanes uh, as their food source. I think they started off using um, uh, sulfur compounds, so things with H attached to S, these things had been um, actually bred to uh, use silicon attached to uh, H, right? Very good yeah. uh, energy I source, if you can find it. I think we actually had a science circle um, presentation about that uh, in the past um, that, that sort of talked a little bit about some of these um, uh, interesting uh, uh, metabolic systems that we can either engineer or bring. Yeah, there's uh, life forms that use, uh, I think it's called chemosynthesis, and there's photosynthesis. Uh, our, our, our lives depend on photosynthesis as we eat plants. But right. The chemosynthesis, the chemosynthesis, of course, is uh, what, you, what you have during these, uh, for these open vents, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Yes, they don't need, yeah, they can, they live without sunlight, which is uh, remarkable. Well, the fascinating thing about this, and we could bring it back to the space thing, is that the more we understand those types of life, the more we'll understand life that we might find under the oceans of Europa or Titan or places, cold, cold areas that, uh, um, as, as you know, under Europa or other ones that with liquid water oceans, it uh, could very well be that if there is life, it's around uh, fumaroles, black, um, uh, what do they call it? Um, you know, the, 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 uh, black uh, <laughs> fumaroles that are on the bottom of the ocean that we have here at, on Earth uh, that do uh, metabolize uh, uh, sulfur rather than oxygen. Black smokers, perfect. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that leads to another interesting discussion. What about life? Are there life in the universe? Well, what about in our solar system? Is there other life beyond the Earth? And uh, what what? Um, uh, Vic uh, or Phil mentions is the uh, is uh, Europa, which has an ocean be beneath its icy crust, which could be a source of life, but maybe Mars as well. Maybe there are, are bacteria beneath the surface of Mars. Maybe on Titan there's life, but I, I think Europa is a little more interesting because it has water, just ordinary water, and you can have life in, in um, living in the water. Yeah, a Titan used to be the darling prospect for life, but it's but Europa has surpassed it. And I'm curious about Europa because it's so cold. Um, I I would predict that if there is life there, it metabolizes slowly, um, and um, and you know might it might be hard for us to recognize that it's alive. Um, 
because uh, it's the transformations or the, maybe the chemistry, uh, the chemical reactions maybe are happening so slowly that uh, we might not appreciate it at first. And, um, and I think we, we talked about this a little bit too Yeah, Mike brings up an interesting point. Uh, the, the ice is kind of thick. I don't know exactly how thick the crust is, from like a kilometer thick or so, but the, the, there, uh, there are plans to actually go to Europa and drill through that ice and put little submarines in, into the water to see what they can find. So there are plans on the board, even if it will be difficult. Now, I don't remember if uh, Europa is big enough to do this. Uh, if you look at phase diagram of ice, or of water, there's uh, several solid forms of water. And if you have a, uh, like a body of water, an ice moon that's large enough, you could have an icy crust of the ice that we're used to. Underneath that would be an ocean. But at the bottom of that would be another layer of ice, um, ice four or something like that. Um, and it seems to me that if you don't actually have other stuff like uh, rocks and minerals and um, you know, other uh, trace elements easily available, that life uh, that could um, possibly live in the liquid part uh, would um, have a hard time scavenging enough uh, materials to actually be alive. Yeah, and of course, it's so cold there, how can you have liquid water? And I think, uh, as you've mentioned, there are minerals dissolved in the water, which helps water stay in liquid form. And it and it's tidal friction. It's like with Io that has volcanoes and such like that. Obviously, it would be too cold to have any uh, water, uh, liquid water. But uh, because of the tidal uh, friction, it's able to uh, have the liquid water oceans under that very thick ice crust. And that's why you could have uh, black smokers and such uh, and life around them, because oh. the the the, that, that's, the that's water is only. Uh, you know, it's liquid water. We could we could have a little submersible in there and go checking it out ourselves. Fascinating. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point because uh, I, I did mention when I gave my talk on the moon about how the the moon um, under underwent some tidal friction in its interior, which is why one face is locked towards us. Well, this is, there's a similar thing going on with the moons of Jupiter. They're in elliptical orbits. It's it's a slightly different mechanism, but because they're in elliptical orbits, they go closer to Europe a little, uh, to, to Jupiter, and then further away from Jupiter. So the tidal forces change, um, and that causes it to, um, to, to basically stretch and then unstretch. So it's going through these, um, these motions where it's being stretched and then, then, then stretched less and stretched more, and then that, that heats up the interior. Over time, this would circularize the orbit of the of the moons, but the moons are perturbing each other, so they the orbits don't become circular so quickly either. So hmm. this heats up the interior of the of the moons, and you have, for example, on the, the moon Io, you have volcanism because it's being constantly heated by friction. Huh, fascinating. I had thought and the water is the that also leads to the liquid uh, water in Europe as well, uh, Europa. I thought the water in Europa was due to just the pressure of the ice, that it was sort of like super cooled water that stayed liquid just because it was under pressure. Yeah. The, well, I guess um, that's a contributing factor along with the, the chemicals, right? Along with so yeah, the, the uh, phase diagram of water itself, uh, um, you know, it, it depend, the, weather, the state is going to depend on just how much pressure there is and uh, what the temperature is. So if you have a higher pressure, um, on ice, then you can cause it to liquefy. I mean, there'll be a certain point uh, beyond which it won't uh, liquefy. But uh, you, and of course, if you have dissolved uh, salts and uh, other materials, uh, that'll affect the um, freezing point of the water. And you can get the water to freeze at a very, very low uh, temperature. But if you continue to apply more and more and more pressure, it's going to become a solid at some point. All right. Um, Can I ask well, something real quick? 
Sure. Uh, we're kind of at the top of the hour, so I was just about to say uh, we kind of hit a little stopping point there, but I did want to invite any final comments, I guess, or final questions. Okay. Well, my uh, I'm just butting in here, but uh, I want to – last year I started kind of a probe uh, probing class uh, to see what people are interested in, but this next year I'd like to have a more regular – uh, class, but I need to know from people what they want to learn. In other words, uh, what should we talk about? I can always bring in guests and such and facilitate this thing, but uh, what do you want in a class? What would you like to hear you, about science news or particular topics or whatever? I can kind of judge it by what sorts of questions are here, but I was just wondering if you guys would, you don't even have to answer right now, but think about it and start throwing out some of these stuff and that'll give me some uh, things to think about. Yeah, I would say that input from everybody is important. Um, specify what what you want from from the science circle. I I, I, I don't speak for Chantal, but um, I'm guessing that Chantal would would well. Um. So uh, Stephen Zutify has maybe a good uh, question to maybe help us uh, close out. Here we got uh, what? Oh, here we have possible point and. Why isn't it like a balloon empty in the middle? Um, um, so uh, I guess at this late hour, I'm a little reluctant to uh, get into a new topic about the shape of the universe, but maybe one of you can integrate that into your question here. But I kind of like Stephen's question that uh, what what uh, for the for each of the panelists, what are you most excited about for 2020? Uh, so, uh, Mike, maybe why don't you uh, start, and we'll go down the go down the row from there. What are you most oh. excited about for twenty, maybe twenty twenty, or the immediate future, science well, wise? I'm always excited about um, renewable energy. Uh, so we live in a time right now where there's a lot of interest in uh, taking solar power and turning it into um, uh, stored power that we can use to live. And you know we have uh, huge amounts of energy just coming at us from the sky, uh, and uh, capturing that energy and being able to store it for our use uh, with high efficiency will go a long way to alleviating some of the uh, problems that are caused by our use of uh, fossil fuels. While we may not ever be able to get away from fossil fuels um, completely, if we can. Uh, use uh, the free energy that's coming um, at us, that will certainly go a long way. Uh, yes, that's an excellent point. I, uh, renewables and energy storage, also batteries and so forth, I think are uh, are going to be cr crucial to our future. And uh, and uh, Syzygy, what are uh, 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 Syzygy, what are uh, what, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So many things going on. If I'm going to talk about astronomy, let's say um, exoplanet research. I mean, that that's particularly exciting. Uh, we've already found Earth-like planets out there. Will we be able to see something in the atmosphere? And we can actually look at the spectra uh, of um, absorption spectra through through the atmospheres of these uh, these planets to see if we can find evidence biomarkers, as they're called, to see if there's enough evidence for possibly life on them. Uh, yeah, that's a great answer. I love that one. That uh, that is going to be a lot of fun to see how that how exo uh, planet our exoplanet knowledge evolves. That's going to be really exciting. And uh, finally, Vic, what are you looking forward to? Yeah, that's. I mean, anything about life other than us. I mean, we can't be the only life in the universe. What a sad <laughs> thing that would be. Uh, so I'm looking. Looking to, to find any kind of life, no matter what, uh, somewhere else or telltale signs of something other than just us and, and, and this planet. It, with, with so many billions and billions and billions of possibilities, it would be very sad indeed if life were that rare. So, that, so anything in my lifetime where, where somebody can confirm that there was another source, or even the same, I mean, you know, they could have the same type of DNA, whatever, or we could be from another. In other words, we could have been seeded from somewhere else. But it would be fun to, to see if there were some other type of way to create 
life that wasn't exactly like ours. And that that would be absolutely make my life. Uh, yep, those are all great answers. And I do feel like, um, you know, uh, the prospects for, uh, for the discovery of life, um, either through the study of exoplanets or through the exploration of our own solar system, just seems tantalizingly close now, closer than it's ever felt before. So that's a really exciting prospect. Um, so with that, uh, I, I think um, we're just about at our hour now, which I think is a good uh, a good uh, time period. I don't want to, you know, um, uh, anyway. Um, why don't we go ahead and uh, wrap up this session? And uh, this was really enjoyable. I think uh, I think this is a format we'll want to uh, experiment with again sometime. Uh, it's really fun to uh, just take a, a a variety of questions and. Uh, see uh, see where the conversation takes us. Uh, so I want to uh, um, thank my uh, panelists, uh, uh, Mike Shaw and Syzygy and Vic, for uh, chipping in and helping me with this. And I want to help all of. Uh, I want to thank all of our uh, uh, students here for their questions and their participation in the text chat. And uh, uh, have a happy new year. Mm -hmm. And okay. thanks, Baragon, for your um, wonderful job at moderating us. Yeah, thanks and everybody Matthew. who thanks came. To my fellow panels members, thanks to everybody uh, in the audience. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you again so much, and uh, have a happy new year, everyone.